Okay. Welcome. Uh, my name is Jeremy Schmidt. I am the supervisor of grounds and research here at Plant Delights Nursery Juniper Level Botanic Gardens. Uh, I'm going to talk about irrigation in the garden. So let's get started. And there you have it. Thank you. <laughs> now obviously we got a lot of water coming out of here and most people have hose faucets on the outside of their home. Um, you can always put one of these hoses on it and get water in one, one place at a time. But when it comes to efficient irrigation, we want that water to go to a whole bunch of different places at the same time. We want to minimize the amount of holding the hose that we have to do. Um, in my experience, most home faucets, most uh, outdoor hose faucets, you run about three gallons a minute, two to three gallons a minute, and usually have a, a pretty consistent uh, city regulated or pressure tank if you have a well regulated, about 50 to 60 PSI, as I recall. Um, that part I'm a little fuzzy on because I'm used to wells. Um, to, uh, to run most irrigation systems, small ones, micro-irrigation is what it's often referred to as, uh, usually run with half-inch tubing, you, you only really need about uh, 20 to 40 PSI, and if you get too, too much pressure, you blow it up. Um, for larger commercial systems, which is, if you look around, you see these black spray-painted heads sticking up, yeah. and uh, you need at least 35, 45 PSI, really 45 PSI, to run those um, to their optimum levels. But I just want to show you um, how everybody can, can do a lot of irrigation. A at my home garden, um, I actually only have three gallons a minute coming out of the well. So that actually it puts me on par with, with most people who just turn on their, their city water from their, um, from their hose faucet. So, a lot of commercial uh, irrigation installers will um, go through. There's a separate meter that many homeowners can purchase if they're on separate, if they're on city water, and that's usually rather costly. Um, and if you have a professional irrigation installer come in, they will hook up to that. But if you don't have one of those, you can just hook up to your half-inch tubing. Uh, ah, yes. We need some parts for that. So, the only thing you need to install this half-inch tubing are a set of pruners. And you can use the old, the old classic Felco pruners or these pruners like this. These are real nice, and you get these at the big box stores. They're, they're not that much. I like these. So, all you need to do, and this... Um, this piece is something that you saw in that paperwork over there. It's one of the highlighted items. This is a barbed fitting that fits inside of that half inch tubing. It has a female thread here that is the typical size that would go on your hose. It just screws on. You always want to check two things. One, do you have a hose washer? No, it does not. If you're on city water, you might be able to get by with just a hose washer, which is that little rubber ring. And you want that really anytime you're using a hose, because if you don't have it, it'll leak. And we don't want to waste water. But if you're on a well, you definitely need one of these. And again, that, um, this company sells them. You might be able to find these at big box stores, along with their micro-irrigation systems. Um, there are irrigation supply companies in the area, in the Raleigh area, the Triangle. There are several. Um, they certainly, any irrigation supply company is going to sell what I call blank irrigation tubing because there are no emitters in here, it's just tube. It's just like a smaller, cheaper version of this. And then drip irrigation, so that you can actually see there are emitters in here already. They are spaced at, an, at, a, um, at a specific distance and each emitter gives off a certain amount per hour. It varies from hose to hose and you can, uh, you can do some pretty easy math based upon how much water you know you have available. So, let's do this. So we need to make sure that this little screen is in here, because we're on a well. If we don't use this, 
it goes past this screen, if it's not there, obviously, and we clog up our very small holes that need to emit water. So I'm gonna push that in there. You can poke it in there if you need to with, uh, with this, carefully with this. Okay. Now, we're actually ready. This just screws on. It's got the rubber washer to keep it from leaking. It's got the screen, screen to catch any debris. And that screws on and off. I'll do this again just in a minute. Can I see how you put, which way you put that screen? Um, you want the nipple facing out. Yeah. Because I totally thought the other way. Yeah. It's, it is a little bit counterintuitive. But the reason you want it out is because if you want to screen, if you want to take it out, you need to be able to get it out like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense once you have it. Once you put it in the other way, then it makes sense. <laughs> you have to clean it once in a while? Check it. All you have to do to, to check it is take it off of its connection to the hose and just look in there. You'll see it if it needs it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, that's As far as troubleshooting, the first thing I always do is check that screen. Um, so to put it on here, I like to wet... I'm sorry? What's the name of that connector that you have? This is a, a hose thread, a female hose thread, barbed coupler. Um, the brand, if you want to take a look while I'm talking, all the brand names I've highlighted in there. Everything that I might um, might be using today is on there. It's a company that, that sells all these things, but you can find a lot of things like this. Yeah, take pictures of it. Anything that's highlighted, I've used somewhere on the property or something similar to it. So what I like to do is wet these tips like this, and you just push it in. You want a little at a time. You want to try not to kink the hose because then you lose your, your angle of, of attack getting it in there. And then to really lock it on, although this is that's actually really on there, but let's say you've got pretty high pressure and you want to make sure it doesn't come off. Again, counterintuitive, you're actually unscrewing this thing to lock it on. It unscrews down over that fitting. That is not going to come off. You actually have to cut this off to get it off at this point, which you can do if you have to. But now we're ready to actually go onto this hose. Another thing that will always happen, well, I'll do this part later. Um, there are different bends and fittings. You know, you got L's. Usually you won't need an L. I don't need them very often because the hose is flexible. And so unless you're really trying to run a very formal uh, shape or, or pattern. So like a raised bed? Yeah, if you've got a rectangle raised bed and you don't have the turning radius that this, this flexible tube has, then yeah, you might need some 90s. If you want to get your system a little more complex, you've got T's. So I'm actually going to do that. Another thing you'll notice is that this will want to kink. This comes in rolls and it will kink up if you don't put a counter twist on it as you're undoing it from the roll. So I need a little bit of space here, but I'll try to undo this. Let me also let's make this a little easier. Just gonna roll it like this. Okay. And let's, uh, let's do something a little crazy. Let's just cut it right here. And let's put a T in it. And I try to use, it takes a lot of pressure to do it. There are two different barbs. That's barb one and barb two. Generally, you can get it over the first barb and it will hold and it will give you a good seal. I always try to get it over the second barb too, but sometimes I can't. That's okay. If you're gonna do a high pressure, if you have a high pressure well, mm -hmm. You're going to want a, um, you'll probably want a, um, a pressure reducing kind of valve. I haven't had to use those here. And I know that we're running about 60 PSI, which is more than what they rate these for. So we're... You should be able to see that on your pressure tank. Yep, that sets it. 
So I'm gonna run this here. Okay. Okay. So now we've got a T. If I turn this on, water's gonna just go everywhere. So we don't want that. We need to find some ends. Now, if you've got, again, a well system and you might get some stuff in your line, you wanna use that screen. But you can also, and this helps equalize the pressure. This is, a, um, this is an end piece that allows air to escape quickly. But once the water hits it, it pushes a rubber gasket closed. It's called a flush valve, and this helps push uh, things through your system, and it, it'll allow some small particulate matter to escape through there. So again, I'm just going to take this, screw it on there. It's got a hose washer in there. Again, you'll want that because you don't want to don't want to waste water. And just screw it on. It's pretty straightforward. Same exact fitting, and this is a pretty universal type fitting. You're going to see this across all the brands. Rainbird is a big one. Um, Toro, I think, does a lot of drip irrigation, micro irrigation. So I'm just going to stick that on here. And I'm going to unscrew it to lock it, just like that. And now I should be able to turn this on and it'll you'll hear it hiss and then stop all of a sudden. But we still have another end. I'll show you something else. So I'm just going to put this piece of drip irrigation on here. So sometimes you want to spray water everywhere. Sometimes you just want to drip water directly into the ground, which is very commonly done in a lot of commercial and even homeowner landscapes. But how do you connect it? We well, connect it just the same way. So instead of a T or an L, this is just an inline double-ended coupler. And it'll go on. Just like that. Just like that. So now we've got a piece of drip tube attached to this. These aren't even the same brands. I bought this in 2009, so this has been hanging around a while. But as long as it's that half inch or I think it's 15 to 16 millimeter, that is what you need. You can also get these little end plugs. You can also get, and you want these quarter turn valves. Real handy. Again, all these pieces are less than, this is maybe a dollar. It has, it's a 16 millimeter interior diameter. It says it right on there, which is about a half an inch. Depends on if they freeze. If, if water freezes in this, it pops the top, but they're real easy to replace. Um, if not, and they're in the sun, I've gotten five to ten years out of them, okay. and sometimes I've gotten a month out of them. Yeah. Sometimes I've hit them with the mower, and they don't last very long at all. But again, the nice thing about drip irrigation is you're not investing five grand every time you need to make an alteration or a change. You just you need ten bucks or fifteen bucks, and, and maybe twenty minutes grab your pruners cut it fix it and and you can shift it around so I'm gonna just go ahead and use this end plug and well okay well that's one issue and you probably run into this if you use drip you've got drip emitters right they're inserted into the tube and I have no earthly clue how they're able to do that when you have a thousand foot reel of this stuff but they do. Now this one's so close to the end that I can't insert this into it. So, just going to take one for the team here. Problem solved, that's right. So now we're going to plug it up. Okay, so I didn't get to the second bar, but that'll hold. You're not going to be able to pull that out. All right. Another thing you'll want, and I don't have it here, is something to weigh it down with. I often 
will bury a lot of this tube just under the mulch is fine. Okay. So let's see, we've got that and that. As soon as I open this up, it should blow up and get everybody wet or it'll, <laughs> it'll hold and we'll see. Yep. Here it is. It's mm -hmm. All right, good. Is it dripping now? Yeah, the other one. Yep, the so the, uh, this last couple feet here is drip. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so there you go. That's what a nine, eight or nine inch spacing, and uh, it's about point um, point four or five gallons an hour, something like that. So it's very slow. But that's the great thing about it is you can you can have several hundred feet of this going on a single garden hose, and you're irrigating a whole area. This is pretty cool, and it's letting some air out. These are pretty old, so there might be some clogging in them. But there's that. Now I'll show you something else really, really cool. Some people don't have these fancy brass valves like this. It's a little air out here, okay. So, one thing you probably want, oops, is, like I mentioned earlier, these quarter turn valves. Just like the others, just plug them in. These only have one valve, or one um, barb, so. I've never had one pop off before, and I'm running about 60 PSI. Righty tighty, it's closed. So, so those valves could also make it possible to have different stations? Yes. Water at different yes. At one time. So for example, if you've got your, your hose here, let's say you had a T here, mm -hmm. right? You tee off here, valve here, valve here. Mm -hmm. You got another T here. You could put a header of T's right here, and you could go all different directions have your hose plugged into one spot and you could have one zone at a time if you have enough water maybe two zones at a time all through one hose screen and yes I do this in my home garden I have some with up to three valves and then I have sub zones and then it's just weird it gets crazy but can but you, yes uh, put a timer at the yeah. yes you can time? absolutely you so actually the there? there's a timer sitting on the ground right here we like uh, these are big box store. I mean, this is, these four zone ones are 50 to $60 a piece. I mean, we've found that the stuff you can get at the big box stores is adequate. Okay. They don't last forever. Um, we had one that lasted not, I think, like one season. One season. <laughs> yeah. It just depends on if they're out in the sun, if the battery runs out, if um, and, the yeah, we, we have these die sometimes. One cool thing about them, though, is even after they're dead, well, I'm not going to do this, but you can take the brain off. At least you get a four-way splitter out of it. Huh. You can turn them all to manual and still use it. But yes, we do use timers in the garden quite often. I like using these when I need to run like a tripod. Most of you have seen those. I'll use those to establish newly transplanted plants, um, which is another kind of garden irrigation is establishment water. When we transplant something in the middle of summer, it will establish very quickly, but in that time, we need to be hitting it with some water every 20 minutes for days. And in, that's where we use timers and tripods. Works out very well. Now, when you say tripod, are you talking like a sprinkler? Yeah, yeah, yeah good old. Good old sprinkler, got three legs and a little thing, like an impact head, it just... Yeah. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Yep, so we use that to establish new grass, we use it to establish transplanted, uh, usually woody plants. You know, when our once a day irrigation isn't going to cut it, and someone holding a hose out there is too, too expensive. So, yeah, we do use timers. Alright, so we've got, a, we've got this in there, so I'll just open that back up. And then it should hiss again once I open this up. Yep, there it is. So it's on. Now it's off. What's the pressure if it's not a well water? If it's like um... city is is usually in that. I think it's about sixty, but 60. I could be wrong about that. And I don't know. I don't know if that's something you can Google or ask. Maybe, maybe your water company. Yeah, ask your water company. Yeah. Um, okay, now something extra cool. So there's a little bit of drip here, but really we're not irrigating much right now. So that's so, I have a yes. So the white lines, you just 
it's like a hose. Yeah, it is. Instead of a 5 8 yeah. hose, that's a one half inch hose. And that's usually just a few cents per foot. It's far less expensive <coughs> than a garden hose and it can be buried. Okay. It's not, you're not going to be able to, to pressurize it all the time every day. Um, eventually it will <coughs> fail and you know the, the material to keep the water contained is just not there forever. Um, whereas a garden hose can be, it's a little bit more durable. And then of course your, your rigid PVC pipe, like you see in more commercial settings, certainly that's made to last and be pressurized indefinitely, which right under us right now, it is. It's pressurized <coughs> 20, 30 years at a time. So now we get into some real little stuff here. So these are, um, pass these around. This is a, a little mini barbed coupling. That's I think one eighth inch or one, one eighth inch. That does not let a lot of water through. But they're like one or two cents a piece. And what they allow us to do is pretty cool. So we're gonna drop down a little smaller yet. We're going to, I'm gonna punch a hole in this thing. And this is something that you can buy. This is, this allows you to punch into your irrigation line, your, your flexible hose like this. Um, they're four or five bucks. They're not too much. And honestly, get a, get a roofing nail. Thank you. Get a roofing nail. You can do the same thing for almost free. I use a roofing nail at my house. What's the name of it? It's a, like a hole puncher. It helps you, it helps you punch a hole in the side. It's probably going to spurt once here. You probably want to give a little side pressure to the tube or else it might collapse it. There we go. Punch it and I'll stick that in. Usually clicks twice, once past the barb and then it'll hit the, the baseline there. And I'll just show you how much water this lets out if I just have it open. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot of water with this much pressure. Okay. Not really. What we're going to do is put this, again, it's all barbed. So here's now, we're at one eighth inch tube. And I'm going to cut it right about here. It cuts real easy. And you can buy these little heads here. I'll, again, I'll pass this around. This is a 180. Okay. And this is a 360. The 180 can pass a piece of sand, the 360 definitely cannot. So as you build a system, any sand, any particulate matter, a piece of dust can clog that 360 head. But they're what, 10, 25 cents a piece. They're difficult to clean, so I just replace them. The cleaner you keep your water, the longer they'll last. I'm going to do, they come with these little, it's actually threaded to help them set into this tubing a little bit better. And so I push them in and I kind of screw them down as I'm pushing them in. Again, you don't see me gluing anything. There's just no need. These have a little teeny tiny quarter churn on them, depending on what brand you get. Right now it's open because it's in line. Now it's closed because it's 90 degrees off. And they spin freely, open, closed, open, closed. They, there's no threading there. They just open or closed like that. And then you can put this in here. These clip into these stakes. And there's a lot of different brands of stakes out there. Most people charge way too much for them, but they're definitely worth it. If you want to go cheap, just get yourself a some rebar or something rigid and get some little zip ties you can zip tie it to it i've got a a wood fence with some wire in it and i just run it up and zip tied it to the wire so there's a lot of different options out there this is nice if you need taller yet then get uh, get some pvc and spray paint it then you can really get up there a couple of feet thank you thank you <laughs> okay these heads, whether it be a 90, you can buy those. You can buy a, the 180, which we have right here. You can buy a 270, and that's the degrees of a circle that it's shooting. Um, and of course, the 360. 
Um, they all shoot about the same, which is not a great way of doing it. Um, it's not a perfect grid, a perfect coverage of irrigation, but it's not bad. They all shoot about one third of a gallon a minute. So if your, fo if your, if your hose faucet has three gallons a minute, then you can probably run about 10 of these in a single zone with one of these. So I'm going to make sure that this is pointing towards the garden. There we go. You'll see it's pretty much, let me get it started here. It's pretty much a perfect 180. And so you can run this right along a sidewalk and you won't even get the sidewalk wet. So you can be very precise with where you put the water, but it's running out there about 10 feet to 12 feet in either direction. And if you don't like where it is, you just turn it off. Yeah, you can pick it up and move it. Well, and that's another good point. Let's say that you, um, where did I put that one? Here we go. You can also buy goof plugs. They're actually called goof plugs. Let's say that you're just kind of done with that one. Yeah, exactly. I don't want it there anymore. I need to move it. Okay. Well, you get the goof plug, and you gotta. You want to hear it click. If it don't click, it's probably not in. There it goes. Let's see if it holds or not. There we go. So we were able to move it. <coughs> that being said, let's um Okay. Okay. And then and this will reach everybody standing here, but I'll put in a 360 so you can see what that looks like. Okay. Of course, a 360 it doesn't matter which direction it's pointing. I'll make sure it's on. And there it is. That's what they do. So if you need it taller, you just put it on a zip tie that or stick that in a piece of um, PVC, make it a little taller. This is using, again, one third a gallon a minute. It's almost reaching everybody here so you can see the size of an area that it's actually getting. The only thing is, it's just not a lot of water. So for it to be effective, you're going to need to run it for a while. But you can put about 10 of these on a single garden hose, assuming you have that normal about three gallons a minute coming out of your spigot. Obviously, if you're off a well or you have a separate um, irrigation meter on your house, then you might have dozens of gallons a minute and you could run half an acre of these all at once. Um, so you're looking at about, just, just what I have right here, there's about uh, 15 to $20 in material. Um, not bad. When I do this in my home garden, when I use this system, whether it be the 360s or the 180s, I, I space them in a formation of what's called head to head. I want this one to hit the head next to it. You don't want them to reach and barely touch in the middle because any obstruction, and I'm guessing that most of your gardens will have plants that are, that are taller than this, it's going to hit stuff. There will be obstruction. Um, there will be leaves and foliage that get in the way. So if it's head to head, then if it hits foliage from one direction, there's a better chance that the, the head next to it is going to hit that same spot and you will get full coverage. We do that in the garden with our big irrigation heads. They're spaced about 32 to 34 feet apart because that's their radius. We want to make sure that every head can hit every head that's next to it. Um, so that you've seen the 360, you've seen the 180. Uh, let's see here. 
That's about it for the micro irrigation. And I can answer more questions after the talk. But just briefly, I want to get into how we irrigate Juniper Level Botanic Garden and a little bit more about how much water we give it. We shoot for, during the main growing season, we, wanna, we want to have one inch of water a week, about. If we can get an inch of water a week, we're usually okay. Um, when we, want, we want our coverage to be as even as possible. We have over 28,000 different kinds of plants. About 23 to 24 of thousand of those different plants are growing in the same exact irrigation schematic. We want a certain amount of precipitation um, per square foot, about an inch a week, as I recall, um, wherever we have an irrigation zone. We have about, including the nursery, we have over 300 solenoids. And a solenoid is essentially, it's an electronic version of this guy right here. It turns on and off electronically. We have over 300 of those, so there's a lot of wiring under the ground as well. Um, but what, what, what are these heads? I've got one right here, and these sit on these heads here. This is a three-quarter inch male thread, and it just threads on. That's, that's really all there is to it. These heads, this, is the, this happens to be the Rainbird 5000, and it's a 5004 or 5000. Again, it needs 40, 45 PSI per head to function within its, its specs. And it'll shoot about 34, about 34 feet in any direction, depending on what chip you give it. And this is where it gets fun. So right now, this irrigation head is set to, when it runs, it does this, and then it hits a spot where it starts back the other direction. Kind of like those old-fashioned oscillating sprinklers that do this, and you run through them like when you're a kid. So right now, this goes from there to there. This is set at about 270 degrees. You can set them at pretty much any degree that you want, including 360. Let's just open this up and look at its guts. This can usually pass some pieces of sand. Um, let's see here. Probably about 10 or 15 pounds of force is needed to actually push the spring up. And that's where your water pressure is so important. It actually, the water pressure is, is driving a motor inside of this thing. And it pushes this spring up, it compresses the spring. This thing pops up, water shooting through here. And again, it's able to oscillate a certain amount. If you look in there, that's where the water comes out. But right now, there is no regulating chip. So it's with 45 PSI, it's going to shoot everywhere, and you're going to get about nine gallons a minute coming out of this thing. You don't want that. Each one of these comes with one of these plates of various um, size, I guess you call them regulating chips. And so here's what we do. At Juniper level, when an irrigation head shoots 360 degrees, it gets a six gallon a minute chip. When an irrigation head shoots on a 180, it gets three gallons a minute. When it shoots on a 90, it gets one and a half gallons a minute. That way, you get the same coverage because a 360, well, it's, it has to do with the time it takes to complete that, that cycle. But because you're shooting less water, but over one-fourth of the area, it shoots the same as something doing a 360. And that's what we want. So really on these, we get all these different options. Almost all the time, we're going to be looking for the one and a half, the three, and the six. And so let's see. Let's go with our six gallon a minute chip. I'll pop that off of there. I'll push that up. Then I'm going to take it. You might want to wear gloves when you do this because if it slips, it can pinch you a little bit. When I say a little bit, I mean a lot. <laughs> but the six, it, it actually is embossed on there. You can see the six on there. And you just you push it in with your thumb. Just like that. And it's in. Now, if you're running 60 PSI, 
that chip will, will fly out and you don't want that to happen because you don't. There are places to put your screwdriver in here. This is a tool that actually comes with a case of these irrigation heads but can be purchased separately at your irrigation supply stores. I don't know if it's a special irrigation head tool. I'm not sure what name it is but you know here's a rainbird head here's the rainbird tool and what you'll do there's a screw that will come down over this and you simply go in there it's kind of sealed up and there we go takes a while I'm gonna do that there it is and you can see now the screw has come down over that that's not going to be able to fly out anymore and this is also a way to adjust your throw so if maybe you don't need to throw so far with this one you can screw it down more and it gets into its throw and diffuses it and you see this with your your tripods things like that they um you can actually adjust that on impact heads too so we're there we're six gallons a minute right now i am I'm at about one, I'm at about a hundred, about 200 degrees. So I want 360 because I got a six gallon a minute chip in there. So I'm going to follow. There's a plus and a minus on there. You just turn it the direction of the plus and it'll stop because it can't go anymore. Because now that's 360. Whoops. And you just put that on there. That's all there is to it. So these are about, I'd say, twelve to fifteen dollars a piece. Um, again, this is going, this is throwing six gallons a minute, but you can do a 360 degree with a one and a half gallon chip or a one gallon a minute chip. So again, if you leave it on long enough, it'll 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 get the water that you need to the places you need it. Um, again, with a 34 foot throw, if you've got the pressure. 30 to 34 if it's down there in the one and a half to one range you're going to lose a little radius um, but you can actually do this on a, on a home system if you've got the pressure so i just wanted to, to to go through that and show you kind of what what we've got going on here with our expansive irrigation system so is that PVC underground that you bury then yes it is here in raleigh we generally go for 15 inches, 18 inches, that's the minimum. We, I've never seen us freeze that deep, but it also means that you're not going to hit it with a shovel right away. Um, it, you can repair it if you do, but your mains you want deep enough to avoid shovels because if a main breaks, you've got to shut something down to fix it. If an, a zone that is normally controlled by a solenoid is hit, as long as the solenoid doesn't open on you, you can just repair it right away. Um, but yeah, I generally shoot for 15 inches or more when I bury our PVC. Only use schedule 40 or greater. Don't ever mess with schedule 20. You'll just pay for it dearly. Um, it's, even, it's actually hard to buy schedule 20 anymore. It's so weak. Um, and uh, get the right tools. You can, you can install it with a trenching shovel, but that's going to take you time. You can rent walk-behind trenchers. Uh, I don't recommend those. I, I despise that machine very much, having used them. Um, you can rent riding trenchers, so you ride on the machine. And now you're talking. That, that's going to be in that four to $700 a day range. But you could do a couple miles of trench in a day with it. Um, but I won't, I won't get too much into all of that. I just wanted to show you the terminal end. Uh, again, we, we try to give our beds an inch of rain a week. We want to keep our soil moist. Uh, moist because the soil is a living thing and if if the soil dries out then your microbes go dormant or die and um, it's those microbes which are so important to a healthy garden not just great soil not just not just soil with a lot of compost in it but soil that's full of moisture and full of life um, that can directly feed the plants and um, that life that also can fend off other life that we don't want in the soil there's always a war going on between good and bad microbes, and we want to favor the good ones. Uh, 
that's all I got uh, to show you here. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Yes. If we have like raised bed vegetable gardens, mm -hmm. how deep would you, what do you recommend the depth to bury the uh, drip irrigation? I'd put it right underneath your mulch would be my suggestion. And, and really for the, the, the main reason being that squirrels will chew on this. And uh, that's, that's one of the limiting factors. Very easy again to fix. Like I showed you the, um, the inline barbed connector there. If a squirrel chews on it, just take your pruners and cut it right there. Put that inline barb fitting in there and just put it back together. It's 25, 25 30 cent fix. But yeah. if it's under the mulch, will the squirrels stick it up? It's not a nut. They don't know it's there. Now, if you bury it right next to a nut, maybe they'll find it and then chew on it. But yeah, you should be good. And, and this is a great way if you have drip irrigation for your vegetable garden to use as little water as possible and know exactly how much water you are using. So I'm, I'm a Midwestern boy. I love corn. And when I plant corn here and when I plant it in my own garden, it is perfectly spaced. It is in the straightest rows that you can imagine. It's the only thing that's in a straight row in my whole garden. But because of that, it's consistently spaced, both the row width and plant to plant. I'm actually measuring. I got measuring tape on the ground. I'm putting the kernels at exactly a certain di distance apart. You can buy a drip tube that you can lay down, and you can have one emitter per plant. You can get that, that specific with it. And then you're not watering your weeds. You're only watering one vegetable plant at a time. I may be a little late to this, but yeah. so are you... Yes, that, we, we've got these, you see the black sprinkler heads. Okay, so like you, okay. Mm -hmm. We try to give them an inch of water a week. A week? Mm -hmm. You don't water every day? No, nope, not if we don't have to. Okay, not do you like we, a deep watering? We generally want to keep the soil moist all the time, and um, we don't look at it as a deep watering or shallow watering. We just, we just want to make sure we hit that mark once a week. Mm -hmm. So if I have a small area like this, mm -hmm. What are the advantages or disadvantages if I was to just weave this drip line mm -hmm. through there rather than having the water spray out, then using the spraying thing? It's great for shrubs. You know, things with extensive root systems are going to benefit a lot from that drip. And the bigger the shrubs are, the more dense your azaleas are or, or whatever you have, it's going to limit the efficacy of spraying water because it's going to hit it. Um, but you can do it both and you can transition into only drip. So let's say you've just started. If you've got enough water, you can have your drip emitter tube on the ground or just under your mulch and you can plug in these spray heads when there's room for that water to run above ground and maybe you've got some perennials. You know, perennials, if, if it's a smaller root zone, it's easy to miss that with your drip. But you can have your spray in there and as your shrubs are successful, then you can begin pulling these out and without having to change out your whole system you just put your little three cent goof plugs in there and you can actually just be done with all that. So how much of a span do these drips when it's dripping how much does it cover I guess? Depends a little on your soil okay. so if you have very sandy soil you're really only going to get about a one foot to a 15 inch width on it if you've got that heavy red clay, it's going to be closer to two or three feet. Um, it, it's not that far, and that certainly is a limiting factor, and that's why when you, if you're doing shrubs, you kind of want to bend the tubing around to each shrub. Uh, that's, uh, that's why I like, in my garden, I actually use spray, even though I've got a lot of shrubs and a lot of perennials. We use these in a few spots in certain areas of the garden, not anywhere like this, but areas that are, are lower maintenance, more peripheral. It works very well because we can do huge areas with just a, a, a hose bib, um, especially with the volume that we have available. We, we're well above three gallons a minute. So, uh, yep. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you so yeah. much. Happy gardening.